Welcome to today's lecture, which is about computer. You know what a computer is, don't you? So give it a try. Just try to classify the following devices. Note PC and this uh, elder mechanical device going back to the 40s, an old Mark I, which could do calculations. This is already a computer or a modern table calculator. Next to it you can see a smartphone. Is this a computer? Or the old abacus, an old ancient machine to mechanical support calculations, especially in Asia. And how's about a car or a washing machine? And of course I'm now talking about modern cars and modern washing machines, including information technology, chips, um, software, hardware to support um, braking, for example, or to give uh, a better performance for washing. Just stop the video in here, think about which of those devices are computers, and maybe you can come up with a definition to simply separate the one or the other device and say this is a computer and that's not. If you look on the modern definition of um, computers, then the term programmability or free programmability is um, the one which is making the difference. Programmability means that a computer hardware can be used for different duties. Just take your own computer, your own smartphone. You can download apps, you can download programs, install them on their computer and by that you make your computer a PlayStation, you can listen to audio or have, can watch videos, you can do calculations using for example Excel, you can browse into social networks and can communicate and so on and so on and so on. Programmability means that you can change the behavior of your computer by installing another program. So basically, when you buy hardware, it um, has no functionality. Yes, a little bit, but let's say not in the end. It has no, not the functionality you would like to have. And you can change the behavior. You can change what you can do with your PC by installing or implementing new programs. In this respect, the computer becomes some kind of universal Thing, some universal device where you can do lots and lots of things and you can just or you're just depending on the software which you have to download onto your computer. Programmability implies that there is a clear separation of hardware and software. So that you can have a hard hardware, you download and install software and by that you change what you can do with your computer. Looking at this kind of definition, let's check our devices again. So the PC is clearly a computer. Even the old ones you could use floppy disks and uh, put in new and install new um, software. Nowadays you do it with a USB stick or you directly download software from the internet. The Mark <coughs> 1 on the right side doesn't have any programs. Basically, all the behavior is implemented directly into the hardware. So if this machine on, on, on the right top corner can now do multiplications and you would like to do additions, then you first have to go into the machine and rewire things, um, the components. How's about the smartphone? Smartphone, according to our understanding, is clearly a computer. You can download apps and by that change what you can do with your smartphone. When it comes to the abacus, it's not. Yeah, there is just these pearls which you can move forward and backward and uh, you're very limited to what you can do here. The car and the washing machine are both in a gray zone. From a user's perspective, that means for you and me, it's basically not a computer because you cannot 
download a software and for example make the car um, a word processing machine. Some person, some technician who has uh, the ability to download software into a car, they would have the chance to for example make a word processing machine out of this car. Same for the washing machine. So they're again in a little bit in a gray zone. What are the learning objectives? Of course, computers have not been like they are today for all the time. Today's IT infrastructure is a result of 50, 60 years of development in IT, maybe even longer. And these years can be uh, of development can be structured according to some epochs. Looking back, epochs can easily be identified. However, at the very moment, you can only identify trends and uh, maybe in a two years or 20 years time, looking backwards, you can say, hey, here, maybe in the, in the beginning of the 20s, there was again a change in how computers and IT is used. It's important to understand once an epoch is finished or it's not really finished then because the uh, ideas and even the hardware, the principal hardware which has been developed and used in these times is still in use up to today. So let's go through the epochs and have a look not only on the IT but how they influenced business and trade and commerce. Let's start with some pre-epochs. So first ideas about how you could build up mechanical computers have already been developed in the 19th century. Charles Babbage was one um, person who engineered an analytical engine and a difference engine. However, the problem was he could only sketch his ideas on a piece of paper because these mechanical engineers weren't able to work so precisely that the machine was able to be built. What you can see on the right side is a modern version of the ideas of Charles Babbage. It has been built in 1989 and you can see, I think, in the British Museum. But it works. So you can do addition and so on. Another person worth to mention is Ada Lovelace. She lived as well in the 19th century and she developed first concepts of programming. So if you talk about free programmability, you have to think about abstract ways of thinking of problems, of um, algorithms and so on. And Ada Lovelace was so maybe the first person who, are, who specified things about um, software, about programming, about this kind of abstractness. Beginning of the 20th century and maybe up to the 60s, there were um, devices in use, as you can see on the right side, which they yeah, were called electronic accounting machine. They can't, could do simple calculations, they were used by in accounting, they were used by cashiers. However, all the programs were fixed wired. Yeah, so there is no software inside, there is no interface where you could upload or download new software. You can see the mechanics by the keys which can be moved forward and backward. Anyhow, it is possible to do this kind of calculations they were used for. There is no operation system like Windows or iOS. And all the system components are controlled by human operators, not like in modern computers where the operating system takes over. And of course, um, the, the whole setup is different. You do not see a monitor nor a keyboard, at least not in our understanding today. Input and output were used, for example, by punch cards 
as you can see on the next side. This is an IBM, not computer, an IBM machine called the multiplying punch, which we're able to uh, multiply. On the right upper corner, you can see the punch cards. Here, some numbers were implemented and the machine can read these numbers, do the multiplications and come up with the result. But again, it doesn't have any kind of software, no operating system and is very limited and by far not freely programmable. So that's why we do not call these machines computer. Maybe it's some, some first step into the right direction. Beginning of the 60s, the situation changes. The first mainframe and later the mini computers pop up. Mainframes are computers which are big in size, as you can see on the left hand photo. They are used up to today, as you can see on the right hand photo. Nowadays, IBM or mainframes or IBM mainframes are still in used in research centers where you have to do massive calculations. The principal setup is that you have a mainframe computer and that several monitors, sorry, several terminals are connected to this mainframe. And the terminal is maybe stupid monitor and a keyboard which has no intelligence by itself. So it cannot do any kind of operations. It can take operations through the keyboard. It transmits these operations to the mainframe. The mainframe calculates the operation and sends back the result to the monitor. So uh, that's how the typical setup of a mainframe is or has been. Why it was possible to develop the computer? That's because the transistor which has been um, developed beginning of the 50s was now able to be used in computers. The IBM 4001 and the IBM 1790 were developed and here we have really the start of commercial IT. And the important thing here is that they had really an uni universal usage. They were programmable. That's, as we explained before, is the characteristic for computers. First programming languages were used. Fortran, which is an abbreviation for formula transition, has been used by engineers and physicians, whereas COBOL has been used for business problems and uh, is is a language which was used in for banking software or assurances comp, um, software. The mainframes became powerful, even more powerful, and were able to handle sometimes a thousand of terminals. There is one important difference if you compare the uh, computer situation to today. At this point in time, all of the components including the software and the infrastructure like a printer or a keyboard, they all were offered by one company. So if you buy a mainframe by IBM, you have to buy software by IBM, you have to buy the monitors by IBM, you have to buy the hardware by IBM, and so on and so on, all out of one hand. And if you go for Nixdorf, you have to buy all common components by Nixdorf. And if you go for one computers, you have to buy everything by one. Just assume situation today where you have, let's say, the ships from one company and they are plugged together by a second company and they are, let's say, then um, used or uh, sent to Aldi where you can buy them. You put um, an operating system from Microsoft on top and you download software from a third party through the Internet. So this wasn't able at all at this point in time. By end of the 60s or mid of the 60s, some new um, devices popped up, namely the mini computers. Mini computers are still big in size, as you can see on the picture. However, they're smaller compared to the mainframes. And where mainframes were used on a company level, 
because they were so expensive and they were so powerful, mainframe, uh, sorry, mini computers were able to be used by only some kind of department. So maybe the depart marketing department has, it, uh, has its own mini computer, the production department, the finance department, they all have one computer to do finance and marketing and production. Using these type of mini computers, IT could be decentralized. Let's have a look on how, what is the impact of mainframes and or mini computers on digital transformation. So what is really enabled by using mainframes and mini computers? And let's take a simple example. Most of the companies have to handle invoices. So you send a product to your customer, then later on you send an invoice and of course there is a process behind which should be supported. A simplified process you can see down in this uh, diagram. At the beginning you have to prepare an invoice, then you send the invoice to the company B, Company B receives the invoice, checks and controls the invoice, pays the invoice. At the same time, the sent invoice is stored as a copy somewhere in a folder. Yeah, once the payment comes in, you check if the payment is correct and you change your status to paid and close the process. And we do not go into special cases that money is not paid in time, something like that. So the question is, how can a mainframe or a mini computer support this kind of process and change culture, organization or whatever in the company? Think about it and come up with a proposal. Epoch 2. Beginning of the 80s, the personal computer popped up. Let's first have a look on the picture on the right side. That's a PC, as you can see. If you compare the PC with a today's PC, what is the difference? And what components or what parts of the computer are basically the same? Not that modern as today's ones, but in principle they are the same. To start with things which are the same, the PCs do have a monitor on its own, they have a keyboard, and they have, let's say, the part the, where the actual intelligence is inside, where all the components which makes the computer do the calculations are in. You can see it in this gray box with these black floppy disks. What is different to today? Today's PCs do not have floppy disks anymore. They are too slow and uh, they have no, do not have the right capacity for today's demands. Instead, you have a USB stick or internally you have a hard disk or a SSD disk. What is different as well? You do not see a mouse. The mouse has is an in invention, let's say, later 80s, beginning of the 90s. And so is, for example, Windows. So what you do not have is several windows on the screen. You just have one. You do not have scroll bars. You do not have mouse and the buttons. So the only way to communicate with your computer is a keyboard. That was a little bit more cumbersome and you had to, yes, had to get used to it. So computers were not, let's say, things everybody could use right from the start without any kind of training. But besides that, computers and PCs are more or less the same as um, today. You can, of course, discuss which company and, uh, has produced the first computers. There were some type of PCs by Apple, Xerox, Alto and so on. But the first one, which really became a mass product, was the 9081 PC by IBM, where you can see this photo on the right side large distribution in the US, later as well in Europe. And here some interesting point happened. IBM decided to let Microsoft B 
build the operating system. You remember? Up to now, a mainframe, there was this slogan, you have to get everything out of one hand. If you buy the hardware by IBM, you have to get the software and the operating system as well by IBM. So why is this different now? Actually, it was back to a misjudgment by IBM. IBM uh, was, uh, were arguing real computers are mainframe. PCs is just some kind of toy, some niche product. So we are a computer company. IBM is a computer company. We uh, focus on our core business, which is real computers and not these kind of uh, nice and cute toys. So they asked another company and Window, uh, sorry, Microsoft stepped in and developed this DOS, this disk operating system. Microsoft had another vision. Microsoft were under the impression in the long run, the operating system is a system which controls the market. And they were right. If you nowadays talk about your computer, the question is, do you have a Windows computer or do you have an iOS computer or maybe a Linux computer? But nobody really talks about where the hardware is coming from. And the ships are nowadays manufactured somewhere in Asia and they're put together maybe in the US or in Asia as well. And if you buy a PC from Al by Aldi or a PC in the media market or you, you get one by Dell, you don't mind actually what kind of hardware is really inside. You look at the key performance indicators. However, the operating system is the important part. It's the part which depends, which decides what kind of hardware is underneath and what kind of software you can put on top. So the company which controls the operating system actually controls the market for PCs. Just compare it with smartphones today. Yeah, here you have Android by Google and you have iOS by Apple and those are the leading companies when it comes to smartphones. Later, uh, Windows made some kind of cooperation with Intel. Intel is a company who produces chips. So both could very well cooperate, cooperate as they were not competitors. Microsoft got first information about this new generation of processors and could design their operating system to work well with this processor. And vice versa, um, Microsoft could ask Intel, we would like to go this direction, could your next processor do the following things? So this term Wintel PCs popped up in the 90s, which means you have a Windows computer on top of an Intel ship based hardware. At this point in time, there is some reframing. The computer is no longer only a computer, something, some device to do calculations. It becomes a desktop. It becomes a device which is used in uh, secretaries. Therefore, we do have word processing. We have spreadsheet calculation and we use metaphors like folder or desktop or um, a paper basket, things you have in, in a secretary. At this point in time, PCs have been standalone. They have not been connected to any local net network, nor to any internet, which was not widely spread at this point in time. So if you think about a PC at this point in time, think about a standalone PC which is not connected to any other computer. Again, what are the impacts of PCs on digital transformation? Just have a look on the process and think about how PCs change now the way the process is going. If you think about the limitations you have, if you just have standalone PCs, then some th things pop directly up. For example, if you're in an office and uh, you need to print out something, 
and your computer is not connected to any network, not to any network printer, then each and every person has to have a printer of its own directly con connected to his or her computer. And there are more things. And um, here the idea comes into the game, what, how could we improve the performance of the computer by centralizing some services, for example, the print service. Basically, that's what we have done in the university as well. We do not have a printer for each and everybody. We do have a centralized printer. And if you would like to print, then your print command is sent to a central computer where a PC, sorry, where a printer is connected and you will have to fetch it up there. By that, you drastically improve the efficiency of your network. You have to invest lower resources, but you get the same result. You get printing for everybody. There is not only printing as a service. There are other services as well. For example, a file server. Think about the following situation. You are handling data on your computer and your colleague would like to share. And uh, you do not have then to um, store the data on a USB stick or on a floppy disk. You can just move it to a file server and each and everybody in your department can access all the files on the file server. And there are more advantages with a file server. If everybody makes a copy of his or her files on the file server, then a backup has only to be done on the file server and not an, on each machine. And there's more and more services. Think about web server or mail server, where you have one central machine supporting your communication, your distribution of information and so on. So this principle that there is a server which offers a service to lots of other computers, which are called clients, this principle is very powerful and so beginning of the 80s, this has been established as this client server principle. And again, this client server principle still works up to today. We still have web servers, mail servers, etc. The picture on top is a little bit more easy. It shows the principal aspects of a server and clients. However, nowadays architectures tend to become more complex. What you can see here, for example, is that a client still accesses a web server, which on, on his side um, um, sends a request to an application server, which again goes back to a database server, which uses a database in the end. So you have here a client server architecture with several levels or several tires as it is uh, called. Using client server computing, companies can now distribute computing services on several small and cheap servers. And these servers offer services to all connected PCs, the clients. Novel Network was one of the leading companies. Later, Microsoft took over. Nowadays, very often Linux servers are used because they're stable, highly performant and reliable. And again, nowadays most of the companies rely on complex multi-layered client server architectures. And again, have a look on our example process. If you have client server architecture installed compared to standalone PCs which are not interconnected. What are the advantages? And how does this change the handling of invoices in the company? Some years later, roughly beginning or middle of the 90s, the internet pops up or the internet gets more popular. It's hard to visualize the internet I've taken a picture from Wikimedia. You can see a network with lots of, let's say, knots and uh, edges. 
basically what is the internet we talk about it in a later chapter however in brief the success of these client service architectures the success of a small local network led to increasing networks networks which are interconnected to bigger networks and these interconnected networks they are called internet it was possible due to these uh, common standards and one to name here is the TCP IP standard which we'll discuss the next week. On top we did not have only the internet but beginning of the 90s the World Wide Web became available. So the World Wide Web is something different compared to the internet. And like the mouse and windows offers more easy access to a computer the World Wide Web offers an easy access to the Internet and to the services in the Internet. And of course, today most PCs or basically all PCs are connected to the Internet. What kind of influence does this have on computing in the business? So if you think about the Internet, then it's not only the Internet but let's say some 20 years experience with business uh, software on PCs and computers. And in the first years, just because computer were not so powerful and people simply had to make first experience, they focused simply on one domain, for example, on production or on finance or on marketing, something like that. And of course, if you have, let's say, this focus on one single domain, what you do not have is um, the integration of it all. And this leads to real drawbacks. For example, the, both the marketing department and the production department and the finance department, they all have to deal with customer. So once the marketing department gets um, requirements or contracts, yeah, the production based on this contract has to, let's say, exchange ideas and uh, get information by the customer. And the finance department later on has to send invoices to the customer. However, if all these three departments have customer, they need some kind to store customer data. Now this customer data is stored at three places. and. The main problem is here not the waste of memory. The main problem here is the tendency to have inconsistencies. So if, for example, the address of a company changes, if the address of a customer changes, then it's probably or most often just changed in one of those databases, in one of those systems. So things can start to get inconsistent. There are other problems. Um, for example, if you get an order by a customer, then the order first starts at the market and it goes further to the production, continues to the out uh, logistics and ends up in the um, invoice department. So what you have, if you have separated systems, you do not have a continuous process, you just have interfaces between where you probably have media breaks and so on and so on. And again, these kind of media breaks, they cause problems. So what you need or what you would like to have is one overall system instead of separated systems per domain. And this company-wide software, this is called Enterprise Resource Planning System or in brief, ERP. And the German company SAP is a world leader, world market leader when it comes to ERPs. And you have now to see that several things can have come together. First, machines have become more powerful to be able to have enterprise resource planning systems on one system. You have experience for production systems, for finance systems, um, for more than 20 years. And what is important, you finally have all PCs interconnected due to the fact that we have internet.
you do not have local area networks only which are good for let's say the finance department you have connections between each and every computer in the company and maybe even to the computers of your customers or a few vendors that drastically changed the situation again let's have a look on your invoice process how does this invoice process change due to the fact that you have ERPs and that these computers are all interconnected to the Internet? Beginning of the 2000s, the term cloud computing popped up. So what is a cloud? What does it actually mean to work in the cloud? Often the Internet is visualized by a cloud because you do not have to know about the details. So if you send an email from Aachen to let's say the US, you don't have to think about where it goes along, if it goes to Cologne, Hamburg, New York or if it goes any other way. So this kind of, you do not have to know the details, are visualized by the cloud. Now this cloud does not only offer communication, it nowadays offers more infrastructure. So you can store your data somewhere in the cloud. Do you use Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that? Then you store your data in the cloud. If you use Dropbox, do you know actually where your data is hosted? In Europe? In Asia, in New York, does it matter? The first answer would be no, that's what a cloud is all about. I do not, I'm not interested where it is stored. I just, want, I just would like to access whenever I go into the internet. Of course, things are a little bit more complicated. If you think about, for example, data privacy, then it is an issue where data is stored because the data privacy um, is not taken as seriously in the US compared to Germany and the big cloud companies these are Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Apple so be aware where to store if it's just your private data everything is fine however is you if you're doing business then maybe it is an issue if you store your data at, for example, Amazon. And even if Amazon argues our server, really the, the hardware, is located in, let's say, Ireland, in the EU, then you're not safe. Because the US government is arguing, hey, Amazon, we don't mind where your hardware is uh, really located. You're an American company, so you have to follow the rules. You have to follow the law, follow the laws of the American um, for American companies. So your data is not safe. What really is true here, what is legal, it's always in discussion and the discussion goes forth and back. So better be on the safe side and take measures. Could be, for example, to choose a German company or an European company which really host their data in Europe or that you do end-to-end -end encryption that means you encrypt at your side before you upload your data to the cloud provider. Nowadays it's not only about storing data it's about running software at the cloud or even using complete software packages. So, for example, if you have a look at Office 365, you can use Office 365 using your browser. You do not have to install this uh, complete software on your computer. And this is called then software as a service. This kind of cloud computing offers lots of new business opportunities. So, again, let's check the question, how does cloud computing really change digital transformation? Take again our small process of invoice handling and uh, check 
what is now possible using cloud computing. Let's quickly go through the com to the epochs again. In this table, you can see all the epochs in the columns, mini mainframe computer, personal computer, and so on. And in the rows, you have um, information about leading companies. For mainframes, this has been IBM and DEC. For personal computer, it's of course Microsoft and maybe Intel, Apple, Dell and so on. Client so server, again Microsoft. Novel at the very beginning, but not today anymore. Internet. Of course, there's hardware companies like Cisco, but on the other hand, you have ERP companies like SAP, Oracle or PeopleSoft. And when it comes to cloud computing, you have those companies which offer really this cloud infrastructure like Google or Amazon. But on the other hand, you have companies offering software as a service. One example, one famous example could be salesforce.com. They offer a marketing software, customer relationship management software, as it's called, which can be only and purely used through your browser. What is the hardware platform in the epochs? Yeah, in the beginning, of course, the mainframe and mini computer very much centralized. The Wintel computer for the personal computers, client server, of course, require a server. Nowadays, many servers run Linux because it's a resource, it's good for resources and for the performance and the reliability. When it comes to internet, new companies which develop hardware for the internet, internet like Cisco pop up. And finally, cloud computing, you have servers outside of the company with all kind of different clients. We talked about the importance of the operating systems. Some of them you might know from, from mainframes, but definitely you know Windows and iOS and Linux. You have at least heard about it. For client server, not so much changes, nor does it for internet and cloud computing. Maybe it changes once you talk about smartphones and tablets, because here new iOS pop, new operating systems have popped up. Business software, yeah, mainframe, mainly accounting, a few applications only, personal computer, very small applications, most of them focused on some special domain like uh, production, often used only in the office, some of them used to steer production, so connected to machines and so on. Client server, uh, the software becomes more powerful, uh, can be used by groups of per people, but still usually focused on one special domain like finance or production or marketing. A big change happens when we come up into the internet because computers are more powerful, because they're interconnected and of course because there is some experience with standalone software already. Now you can integrate it, combine it and come up with what it's called enterprise resource planning systems. And when it goes to cloud computing, you have here these apps Google Apps, for example, and software hosted in the cloud, which can be used through the browser. So installation and maintenance is not no longer required by the company using the software. What are current trends? So we talked about the epochs. Are we in a new epoch? It's hard to decide. Maybe let's say in 2030 or 2040, when we look back, then we can see, yes, here something has happened. So what are candidates? Maybe mid of the 2000s, the pop-up of smartphones have been one of these new epochs. Up to then, PCs have mostly been desktop computers, personal computers, or even the servers. But nowadays, smartphones, are make access to the internet. Meanwhile, more than 50% of the access to the internet is by smartphone. So the mobility has increased and 
By that, the ubiqui ubiquity has increased. So hard and software is no longer limited to computers. Nowadays, we are always online. And uh, other devices now include connection to the internet, like for example, fridges or car or cola machines. New way of working, new way of interaction with your machines is possible. We're talking about these internet of things or variable computing. Another thing is this digital convergence. If you look back 20 years, we did have separated networks. We had a network for computers, we had a network for telephones, and we had a network for TV, and maybe even a network for power comp consumption, electricity. But nowadays these things are more and more mixed up. When I look on my telephone network, I can run computer commands and computer data, data over it. I can, using my telephone network, uh, have a look on TV. I can use a TV network to run computers and so on and so on. This has, is good because we are becoming more flexible, but there is another thing, you become more vulnerable. If you have a virus, for example, which in the past was limited to the computer network, Nowadays, it can spread into telephones and TVs as well, so it has its drawbacks as well. So, what drives this development of IT during these last decades? And actually, is this a fast development? Even in your life, IT has drastically changed. So, think about it, which IT or which IT services did not exist 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago? And once again, is this really a fast development? How can this speed be described or quantified? And what are the root causes for this development and will it continue? The driving force in the development of IT is this exponential growth of processor speed. So the different epochs described on the slides before are the result of really a very, very rapid growth. Exponential growth is something you cannot really imagine. You might remember this exponential growth of Corona in uh, the last two years. So when we have had first five or 10 infected persons, but then suddenly these figures boost and you have not only 10, but a hundred, a thousand, and you cannot really predict what's happening next. And this kind of exponential growth is true for computer, for processor, for memory, since 50 years. 50 years of constant exponential growth. At the same time, exponential reduction of costs, at least related to the performance of the IT equipment. The development has been mostly driven by technology. So people did not ask, we need a stronger, a more performant computer. It was simply possible by all the technology to make computers faster and faster. And later on, people had to think about, hey, what now are we going to do with these high performance computers? And those people who had a good idea right from the beginning, they have developed new business ideas. And the following, the principles, especially this exponential growth, is described a little bit more in detail. The first one who described this growth has been Gordon Moore. And that why this law, why this observation is called Moore's law. Gordon Moore has been co-founder of Intel, the company which is a world-leading uh, developer and producer of sh computer chips. Moore made this prognosis somewhere in, 90, in, in 1965. And at this point in time, he argued just by observing the past that the number of transistors per ship, or better, per square inch in the chip has doubled every 12 months. Later, he changed his observation to 18 months. 
So what does this mean? Doubling every 18 months means a doubling and a doubling and a doubling and a doubling. So always a factor two. And this is simply exponential growth. So what does it mean if uh, a performance, if the performance of a professor du processor doubles? The performance of microprocessors doubles every 18 months, so the processing speed doubles. It means basically that the performance of computers doubles every 18 months, and it means as the price of the chips are constant, that the price of the IT processing is half priced every 18 months. Just as a quick exercise, Suppose doubling of a performance takes place every year. How long does it take to reach the factor 1000? So how often do we have really a factor 1000 if we have this constant doubling? And how long does it take to reach this factor 1000 if doubling requires 18 months or 24 months? Now have a look at your computer. What are the key figures? So memory processing, speed, hard disk, bandwidth, price. And let's take, uh, we have just the year 20, um, 2022. What does your computer look like according to these key figures in the year 2037 according to Moore's law? And what will you do with these kind of key figures, what will do? How will you use your computer in 2037? Let's take a look. What does it really mean? This exponential growth. In this diagram, you see a timeline on the X scale. You have 97 to 20 to 2020, yeah, so the last 50 years. And on the y-axis, you can see there is a constant distance between 1,000 and 10,000, between 10,000 and 100,000, and so on. So each, let's say, 2 cm, we have a factor 10. And actually, that's what exponential growth is all about. Looking on these dots, on these marks in the diagram, these are all processors or memory ships which have been developed and they are placed according to the year and according to the number of transistors they, which are placed on this chip. And basically these, these uh, marks can be um, seen like uh, they're all on one line. Yeah, and this is not linear development because we have this exponential scale on the left side. So it's actually exponential growth. What does it mean? This Moore's law has consequences for business. So on the one hand, which is very nice, we can do a quite good quantitative prognosis about how a computer and how IT looks like in the future, at least when it comes to this performance. However, people, men, are not made to think in exponential growth. We can think about linear growth. So even if we know from a quantitative perspective quite good how computer looked like, we do not have a clue how to use it and how will it change the way IT will work. Again, think about your computer in 2037. What will you do with it? There is more due to the fact that price is constantly declining for hardware. What is the best time to buy hardware? In Aachen, several retailers ran out of money because they cheaply bought a good amount of computer, a good amount of hardware, but were not able to sell it fast enough. And then simply hardware loses money and uh, yeah, again, these company were in the end bankrupt. This disability of making quality progn qualitative prognosis can be seen even by experts. So if you see the co-founder Thomas Watson of IBM, he was arguing 
in the 40s that the world market has only a place for maybe five computers. And Ken Olsen, the founder of Digital Equipment, the company which developed the mini computers, argued there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home. So even in the 70s, it was not really, people did not really think about a computer for as something to play games or something like that. There was a clear understanding it's something for business, so no computer at home. And even Bill Gates, yeah, you know Bill Gates by Microsoft, in the 90s argued internet, that's just an hype. That's why Microsoft really had problems later on to jump into the internet and uh, get speed here again. Based or as an analog on to the Moore's law, there are a few other laws which describe similar phenomenon. Crider's law, Crider is a vice president or has been the vice president of Seagate, argued the capacity of hard disk grows by the factor 1000 every 15 years. Basically, it's the same number, but as transistors and, um, and uh, hard disk have different technologies, it's really good to make this observation as well. Nielsen argued the same about the bandwidth of um, networks. Here is a factor um, thousand, so the doubling is every 21 months. And Kume argued energy preparation divides every half, uh, divides by half every 1.57 years. So again, the technique about these um, three laws is different because we do not talk transistors, but the tendency is going to the same direction. So again, yeah, that's uh, the capacity of mass storage systems are growing exponentially. The bandwidth of networks are growing exponentially. At least if you differentiate and see, com do not com and just compare mobile networks, nomadic uh, networks and fixed networks. In addition, Lyman and Varan have made an observation that the amount of digitally stored data doubles every year. Finally, let's make a comparison. So is really exponential growth fast? Think about a car from the 1960, take this key performance indicator when it comes to the performance of a car in this year and Think about how fast would be, for example, a car today if you would have the same amount of development, the same speed of development when it comes to cars and aviation.